Okie dokie. Yesterday, if you were here, and I think all of you heard, except for Joseph, and he's not here again today, so Jay wasn't here either. Uh, that's what happens when you don't take roll. Um, we actually jumped forward in time a little bit um, in our discussion of the Civil War and talked about Sherman coming to Milledgeville, which is in November of 1864. Um, and today we're actually going to go backwards. We're going to go uh, to 1862 because really the Civil War starts in April of 1861 and nothing happens in Georgia for almost an entire calendar year, um, roughly 363 days. Nothing happens. There's no battle. Um, Georgia is just simply um, churning out war material, preparing for war. Um, but then, in April of 1862, um, war comes to Georgia. There were basically 100 battles fought, a um, little bit more than 100 battles or skirmishes fought in Georgia during the Civil War. 92 of them took place in 1864 and are connected to uh, the Battle of Atlanta or Sherman's March to the Sea to Savannah. Uh, but that first occurs in April of 1862. It's at Fort Pulaski. Anybody know where Fort Pulaski is? Anybody ever been to Fort Pulaski? Tybee Island. If you've been to Tybee Island, you've driven right by Fort Pulaski. It sits off to the left. But Fort Pulaski was and still is an all-brick fort. It's built out of brick. Um, it sits actually in the middle of the Savannah River on a little island called Cockspur Island. And it was actually built in the 1830s, and the engineer that built it was Robert E. Lee, a member of the Army Corps of Engineers at the time. Fort Pulaski um, was used by the United States to protect the harbor at Savannah. Um, during the Civil War, it was actually used for the same thing, at least initially. Confederate forces have taken over Fort Pulaski, and they are using it to protect Savannah. Well, in April of 1862, the United States Army sneaks artillery onto Little Tybee Island, and they begin to bombard Fort Pulaski. And what the Confederates found out very quickly is that a masonry fort, a brick fort, is no match for modern artillery. It is um, over in less than two days. Fort Pulaski is uh, beginning to disintegrate, literally, because of the fire of the Union cannon. Um, and the Union cannon, in this instance, is something brand new. It's rifled. The barrel is rifled. It has grooves cut in it. And those grooves actually spin the artillery shells that come out, and it makes them um, much more accurate, and they can be fired from much greater distances. So the U.S. Army is sitting about three miles from Fort Pulaski, and they're just lobbing artillery shells. Um, Fort Pulaski fires back, but Fort Pulaski can't even see what they're firing at because... Um, the U.S. Army, again, has done this in secret. Um, one thing it does is it convinces the Army that brick forts are not a good idea. And so brick forts aren't built after that. In fact, I'm not sure any forts were built after that because they really uh, had served their purpose. So um, Fort Pulaski falls in two days to the U.S. Army. And pretty much the port of Savannah it's not closed, but it makes it more difficult for things to come in and out of. This is a picture of Fort Pulaski after uh, the Battle of Fort Pulaski. What do you notice about it? What do you see? People. What do you notice about the picture? Broken. It's broken. The wet glass negative... Uh, was broken, but they printed the picture anyway. And of course, when they do, the lines show up. What else do you notice? 
There's a group of people in the front. What about the people in the back? What are they doing? They're not prisoners, not yet. That's coming. Fort Pulaski becomes a military prison. they just kind of hanging out. They're actually playing a game. What do you think? Not soccer. No. They're actually playing baseball. And this is one of the first, if not the first, picture of the game of American baseball being played. Um, and it's at Fort Pulaski. Um, you can see in the background against the wall, actually built into the wall, um, those wooden doors. Um, that is actually where soldiers slept. That was the barracks. And when it became a military prisoner or prison, uh, rather, a little while later, that's where the jail cells were, became prison cells. Uh, Fort Pulaski is actually still in pretty good shape to be uh, approaching 200 years old. Um, this is Little Tybee Island, and you can see how far away they were from um, Fort Pulaski, the United States Army was. And that's what happens when you fire modern artillery at a brick fort. It begins to fall apart. Same thing happened to Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. In fact, uh, Fort Sumter, if you look at it today, it it's basically a pile of brick. Um, Fort Pulaski was actually restored um, and looks pretty decent. In fact, that's what it looks like today. Um, they actually repaired where the wall had been breached, um, but did not repair everything. There's actually a um, an unexploded shell embedded in the wall. You look right there. You can see that shell. Um, and again, they just left it there. It's harmless, I guess. Could explode. Kill everybody inside. Who knows? Oops, sorry. All right. Um, zombie apocalypse happens. I'm going to Fort Pulaski. Because there's one way in and one way out. The rest of y'all own your own. Um, I told you that it became a military prison, and in October of 1864, 600 Confederate officers were transferred to Fort Pulaski. They became known as the Immortal 600. Don't know why. Uh, but 13 of them, and they're listed here on this plaque, 13 of them die from dysentery. Anybody know what dysentery is? Chronic diarrhea. You basically poop yourself to death because your body cannot absorb liquids. It won't absorb liquids, and so you die of dehydration. All right. Um, in April of 1862, or rather... Um, in the spring of 1862, about the same time that Fort Pulaski is being taken by the Union, there's an event that occurs in northeast, northwestern Georgia that we call the Great Locomotive Chase. Anybody ever heard of it? It's a Disney movie, if that helps. The Great Locomotive Chase. No. Huh? I'm sorry. About a train? Yeah, it's about a train. It really is. No, it's not Mickey's Runaway Train. It's actually called The Great Locomotive Chase. It's the name of the movie. Mm -hmm. So, this is what happens. In the early part of the spring, 1862, Union forces under Ormsby Mitchell are advancing on Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville is in northeast Alabama. It's really close to Chattanooga. And Chattanooga is very important because of the railroad. Well, Ormsby Mitchell is approached by a man named James J. Andrews. Andrews is a contract merchant. He trades between 
the Union and Confederate lines. He crosses over both lines really easily. He's trusted by both sides. Um, little does the Confederacy know that he's a spy. And he comes up with a plan. It's actually a pretty good plan. His plan is to lead a raiding party behind Confederate lines to Atlanta, steal a locomotive, and then take that locomotive north toward Chattanooga, cutting um, telegraph lines, destroying the railroad track, burning bridges, um, so that the Western and Atlantic Railroad cannot be used by the Confederate Army to reinforce Chattanooga. It's a pretty good plan. And it almost works. But it doesn't. Unfortunately for Andrews and his raiders, it doesn't work. All right. You read I? Wait, wait, wait. All right, here we go. So this is James Andrews. Uh, he's a, again, he's a spy for the Union, um, but by day he is a traitor. Not a T-R-A-I-T-O-R, but T-R-A-D-E-R. -E he trades things. Um, and he comes up with the plan that becomes the great locomotive chase. On April the 7th, 1862, um, Andrews chooses 22 volunteers from three different army regiments um, and two, or rather one civilian plus himself. So there are 24 men who are going to go behind enemy lines, they're going to steal a locomotive, and they're going to drive it to Chattanooga. So they take a train from Atlanta to Marietta, dressed in plain clothes, of course, not their uniforms. Um, Two happened to get themselves caught. Not sure how that happened. Um, they definitely did not speak with a southern accent, so maybe that gave them away. Two um, overslept on the morning of April the 12th, so they didn't catch the train. The other 20 travel eight miles from Marietta to Big Shanty, which is today Kennesaw, again, north of Atlanta and they steal the locomotive general. Now, how do you steal a locomotive? Well, these guys had a pretty good plan. They knew that at Big Shanty, the train would stop to take on fuel, water, and wood, and everybody would get off to eat breakfast at the Big Shanty Hotel. And so they waited for that to happen, and when everybody got off, they unhooked every car but one and proceeded to steal the locomotive. Unfortunately for them, the conductor and the engineer were inside the hotel and they saw the locomotive being stolen and they immediately jumped up, ran outside, and began to chase the general on foot. And they chase it for about two miles and they discover a push car. You know, those things with the, or it was just a car with a pole that they could push it with. But they, they um, chase it for a couple of miles that way. Uh, the track had been torn up, so they had to abandon the push car. They continue running on foot. They find a little small locomotive called the Yona. It was used to switch trains in the train yard. Um, they follow it for a while, and they come across on the locomotive Texas. Texas is the twin locomotive to the general. Um, they convince the people who are running the Texas to let them have it, and they begin chasing the general with the Texas. There's only one problem. The general's headed north, and the Texas is headed south. So they put the Texas in reverse, and they chase the general backwards toward Chattanooga. What? A train? Engine? Um, and so with the Texas, um, they are finally able to catch the general. There's the general uh, on the right. That was 
a picture taken in 1962. Um, it had been restored and was actually on a tour of the South. The Texas on the left, um, that's uh, a picture of it as it has been restored as well. Both of them you can see in Georgia today. Um, the general is at the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History. I love the museum. Miss Spencer really loves the museum. You need to ask her about it. Ask her about the train museum in Kennesaw. She'll be glad to tell you everything about it. She loves it. Um, but again, the general's on display there. Um, and it's almost, it's, the funny thing is, it's almost displayed in the same location it was in when it was stolen in April of 1862. Um, um, the Texas is in Atlanta at the Center for, or excuse me, the Atlanta History Center. Um, and it's on display right in front of where you would go in to see the cyclorama. Remember, the cyclorama is a big round painting. Uh, the Texas is pretty cool because you can actually go inside of it. You can climb on it and bang the whistle and or bang the bell or whatever. It's pretty neat. Um, so both those are back in Georgia where they belong. Um, in some ways, it, it is a success. The Raiders are able to tear up the track. They do cut some telegraph lines. Um, but Anthony Murphy and William Fuller, that's the two guys that begin to chase the general, um, really are persistent. And every time the men on the general look back, they see they're being pursued, and so they can't stop and tear up as much as they want to. Uh, they're also not able to stop and take on water and wood. And because of that, they run out of steam. They literally run out of steam about 1 o'clock in the afternoon just south of Ringgold, Georgia. They have been on the go for about seven hours. Everybody climbs off the general, runs out in the woods. They're eventually all captured, all 20. Eight of the 20 are hanged, including James Andrews. He's a spy, and that's what they did with spies during the Civil War. They either shot them or hanged them. And so he was hanged. The rest get away, they escape, or they are um, part of a prisoner exchange program that occurs. All of the soldiers received the Medal of Honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Jacob Parrott, First Lieutenant Jacob Parrott, is the very first to receive um, the Congressional Medal of Honor. If you look out in the hallway, um, all of the Medal of Honor recipients from Georgia are hanging on the wall out here, in case you've never stopped and looked at it. That's a pretty cool thing. All right, here is uh, a map showing um, the chase, starting in Big Shanty and ending up in Ringgold, uh, really a little bit north of Ringgold, uh, almost to Chattanooga. You can see where um, they find uh, the little push car and where they pick up the Yona and where they pick up the Texas. And again, they chase, uh, they run the Texas backwards, chasing the general toward Chattanooga. All right. So that happens in April of 1862. Um, and nothing really happens again in Georgia until September of 1863. And that's the Battle of Chickamauga. Um, it's just a few months after Gettysburg. Um, and it has fought about seven miles south of Chattanooga. There's actually a little town there today called Chickamauga. I think it was there then. Um, but the battle is named after Chickamauga Creek. And today is site of one of the two or three national battlefields in Georgia. Um, Chattanooga, again, is very important. It's a rail center, and it's the main east-west rail center for the Confederacy. <laughs> so if, if it has to go east or west, it needs to go through Chattanooga, or it has to go through Chattanooga. Um, Union troops have been in and out of Chattanooga um, 
They actually have control of Chattanooga and they are pushing into Georgia. Um, the Confederacy meets them, the Confederate Army meets them, and actually wins the Battle of Chickamauga, pushes um, the Union Army back toward Chattanooga and actually out of Chattanooga. Um, later, the Union Army recaptures Chattanooga. Um, about three days long, September 18th, 19th, and 20th, um, 58,000 Union troops, 66,000 Confederate troops, about 124,000 men are involved in the battle. It is the second largest battle um, of the Civil War, the second bloodiest battle of the Civil War, um, second only to Gettysburg, which again had happened just a few months previously. And so uh, the fighting is really uh, pretty intense at Gettysburg. It's pretty intense at Chickamauga. Um, some statistics, you can see how many people were um, casualties, killed, wounded, or missing. Um, and you can see where Chickamauga Creek is uh, even today. Uh, even though, excuse me, even though the Confederacy wins, um, they don't take advantage of the opportunity they have to really catch and capture um, the American army. And that proves to be uh, a big mistake for the Confederacy. Uh, picture painting of Chickamauga Creek. Um, I can guarantee you it did not look like that. It was not as pretty as far as the terrain. Um, and then there's a guy named George H. Thomas. He's a general in the Union Army. He becomes known as the Rock of Chickamauga because um, his actions lead to the Union Army being able to get away. Um, they are almost surrounded. In fact, they're going to be surrounded. Um, they've been ordered to retreat. George Thomas either doesn't get that order or ignores it. And he stands and fights. And he becomes the rock of Chickamauga, unmovable, like a rock. Um, he's able to fight um, off the Confederate Army long enough for the rest of the Union Army to escape. And then he's able to escape as well and becomes, again, the rock of Chickamauga. You got to admire a guy that can lay down and take a nap. Just anywhere. And that was George Thomas. All right. Map on the left shows the Battle of Chickamauga. It's kind of an overview. It's not any particular day at any particular time. But what happens? Here's George Thomas. He's in charge of the 14th Corps. Here's McCook. He's in charge of the 20th Corps. They come back to Georgia in 1864. Um, this side of the Union line has pretty much collapsed this way. The Confederate Army is about to surround them, um, and Thomas is able to fight them off long enough for all these guys to escape north back toward Chattanooga. A um, couple of people to note, here's D.H. Hill, talked about him before, and here's John Bell Hood, we'll talk about him a little more um, today. Um, that was Private Jacob Miller. What do you notice about old Jacob? got a bullet hole in his head because he was wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga, shot in the forehead right between the eyes. Um, and it doesn't kill him, obviously. In fact, he lives to be a, an old man. He dies when he's in his 80s. Um, he is wounded at Chickamauga. Um, he's knocked unconscious, as you can imagine. Um, he wakes up. He's covered in blood, some of it his, some of it not. And he gets up and starts wandering around. He starts marching or walking toward what he thinks is the Union line. But he's actually behind the Confederate lines. Uh, but nobody can tell what army he's in because he's all covered with blood. He finally gets out of, um, of that danger, finds Union lines, and is taken to the hospital where he's told, you will die. Um, they dress his wound. He lays around for a little while, gets up and leaves because he doesn't want to die in the hospital. He doesn't want to die, period, but he certainly doesn't want to die in the hospital. And he lives, um, again, until he's in his 80s. 
the only after effect was headaches, as you can imagine. Uh, but they don't take the bullet out. They leave the bullet there. It's too dangerous to take it out. Um, I just love that picture of Jacob Miller. He's got three eyes. In fact, if that were me, I would get a fake eyeball and put it right there. Brandon's thinking the same thing, baby. I have three eyes. You'd never know what I'm looking at. Um, and again, um, y'all probably think, well, there's no way he lived, but it's not that unusual for people to survive um, head wounds of that nature. Um, most of the time, granted, you don't, but people do uh, from time to time survive those types of wounds. Actually, it looked like um, the trees, you know, knocked down. There's no grass. Um, it, it was a terrible battle that was fought there. Um, we talked a little bit of Sherman's um, Atlanta campaign. Milledgeville would, I think, technically be part of the Atlanta campaign. Um, but it actually begins in the late spring, early summer of 1864, April, May, June of 1864. Sherman's left Chattanooga, and they have moved into Georgia. Sherman's goal is to reach Savannah, to cut Georgia in half. And it's very important that he do that because in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected what? 1864, he's up for re-election, and he's going to lose. He doesn't have any chance of winning unless he's given a miracle. Um, he knows he's going to lose. The rest of the United States knows he's going to lose. The Confederacy knows he's going to lose. And his opponent, George McClellan, knows he's going to lose. And George McClellan has already made a promise to the American people. I will end the war. But he's not going to end the war by winning it. He's going to end the war by negotiating peace with the Confederate States of America. And so essentially he does that and the Confederacy wins. Abraham Lincoln needs a miracle. And his miracle is named William Sherman. Sherman begins to engage Joseph E. Johnston, who's the commander of the Confederate Army, in a series of battles, and every battle ends the same way. The Confederate Army gets flanked. The United States Army, the Union Army, is able to get around behind it, and the Confederate Army has to retreat. And this goes on for a couple of months until June 27, 1864. Sherman attacks Johnston. Um, Johnston has entrenched himself on Kennesaw Mountain, and Sherman is able to, or as Sherman is trying to push him off of Kennesaw Mountain. He's about 15 miles from Atlanta at that point. Um, Sherman actually is beaten at Kennesaw Mountain, but he's able to force Johnston to keep going backwards toward Atlanta. Um, the video you're going to watch is probably the best you're ever going to see about anything. The speaker is just filled with knowledge. Pretty um, significant battle takes place here during the Atlanta campaign. It is really the 
My remote control stopped working. It's a nice rock, though, isn't it? So Kennesaw Mountain is actually a defeat for Sherman, um, but Sherman, again, good morning, again, okay. good morning is able to um, push um, Johnston back towards Atlanta. So Johnston is continually giving ground. John Bell Hood... Um, as you heard, becomes the commander in 1860, uh, in July of 1864, July 18th. And he is, to say he's aggressive is an understatement. He is ferocious. He has one arm that works. Um, he was wounded at Gettysburg, lost the use of his left arm, and he has one leg. He lost at the Battle of Chickamauga but he is a fighter, and that's what Jefferson Davis wants. He's such a fighter that he takes unnecessary chances. Um, he attacks Sherman head-on, and every time he does, he loses men. And the Confederacy cannot afford to lose men at this point in time. Um, John Bell actually finds out or figures out that that's not a good idea, um, and so he kind of with withdraws into Atlanta and prepares to defend Atlanta from attack by Sherman. Um, we're just going to skip that. Um, Joe Johnston on the left, William Sherman on the right, um, and that takes us to the Battle of Atlanta. Sherman actually doesn't attack Atlanta. He surrounds it, and he lays siege to it. He's going to starve them out. And so he surrounds the city of Atlanta, his troops cut the rail lines into the city. So Atlanta is not getting food. Atlanta is not getting the things they need to survive. Um, Hood is trying to get Sherman to come into the city to fight an urban battle, and Sherman won't take the bait. bait. Um, Sherman actually sits outside of Atlanta and for two months bombards the city. During July and August of 1864, Atlanta is shelled 24 hours a day, round the clock. Um, and most of the targets are civilian targets, houses, um, whatever's in the city. Uh, September 1st, 1864, Hood gives the order for Atlanta to be evacuated. And so Atlanta citizens um, evacuate the city. Sherman comes into the city on September 1st, um, and he is met by the mayor of Atlanta, and the mayor um, surrenders the city to Sherman. Uh, before Hood left, uh, before the Confederate troops left, they blew up anything that was of value or could be of value to the Union Army, um, and they set fire to many other things. Sherman stays there until about the middle of November and then begins marching south. Um, as they are leaving Atlanta, um, the army burns just about all of Atlanta. About 400 buildings are left. Uh, about 90% of Atlanta is burned to the ground. Atlanta becomes known um, as the Phoenix. Anybody know why? Anybody know what the Phoenix is? The firebird, that legendary or mythological bird that is consumed by fire, and then does what? Rises out of its own ashes. It resurrects itself out of its own ashes. And that's what Atlanta does. Um, it builds on top of all the ruin and becomes what it is today. A um, little quick video, about four minutes, and then you'll have about four minutes to do nothing. The Atlanta campaign in four minutes.
beginning of 1864 brought about significant changes in the Union High Command. The most important of these was that Abraham Lincoln revived the rank of Lieutenant General and appointed Mrs. S. Grant, the architect of victories at Vicksburg and Chattanooga, as General in Chief of all Union armies. Lincoln hoped that with Grant in command, Northern armies could achieve battlefield success in the year of an important presidential election. Replacing Grant in command of all Union forces in the West was his friend, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman. Grant expected Sherman to defeat the Confederate force in front of him and penetrate as deeply as possible into the Confederate heartland. Sherman's opponent, Joseph E. Johnston, inherited a command right with dissension and one whose already low morale had cratered after the recent loss of Chattanooga. Johnston spent much of the winter of 1863-1864 restoring discipline to the command, building its morale, and working hard to create a strong defensive position just outside of Dalton, Georgia, around Rocky Face Ridge. Johnson's defensive position at Rocky Face Ridge is in the northwest corner of the state of Georgia. Roughly 100 miles to his rear is Atlanta, a key railroad hub whose manufacturing facilities are vital to the survival of the Confederacy. Johnson must protect this city and the railroads leading into it, most importantly, the western Atlantic, which is... Wow, place. what happened there? This will also be Sherman's supply line as he advances closer and closer to the gate city. Early reconnaissance convinced Sherman that attacking the position at Rocky Face Ridge was suicide. Rather than attack head-on, Sherman demonstrates against his position with the forces of Thomas and Schofield, while McPherson's Army of the Tennessee sneaks around through Snake Creek Gap south to Osaka, where he's supposed to destroy a vital railroad bridge. Unfortunately for Sherman, McPherson stalls just long enough to allow Johnston to retreat from Rocky Face Ridge and establish a new position at Osaka. On May 14th and 15th, Sherman attacks Johnston at Rosaka and is repulsed. However, a portion of his command manages to sneak around Johnston's flank and threaten his rear. This establishes a pattern that will repeat itself throughout the campaign. The two armies are in constant contact throughout May and June. And no matter how many casualties the Confederates inflict upon Sherman's army, the Federals are always able to get around their flank and force Johnston to retreat closer and closer to Atlanta. This happens at Cassville. New Hope Church, Pickett's Mill, Dallas, Pine Mountain. Even after a disastrous one-sided loss at Kennesaw Mountain, Sherman is able to flank Johnston and push him to the banks of the Chattahoochee River. Confederate President Jefferson Davis is monitoring this from Richmond, Virginia, and he's becoming increasingly frustrated at Johnston's inability to do anything at all to retard the progress of Sherman's armies. The last drop comes in the beginning of July, when Sherman manages to once again get past the strong defenses along the Chattahoochee River and threatens now Atlanta itself. Davis removes Johnston and replaces him with a much more aggressive commander, John Bell Hood. Hood is trained in the Lee Jackson School, and he believes that the only way to achieve success against the Union armies is 